Thank you. Hey, good day, everybody, and welcome to your Ruby live event. My name is Eric Weinkoop, and I'm the director of culinary instruction here at Ruby, and also one of your chef instructors in the courses, along with our uh, other members of the uh, instructional team here. And I want to uh, welcome you today also to my office hours. Uh, this is your chance. Uh, in this open forum to ask uh, nearly any question that's food and cooking related. I, at least I ask you to keep the focus on food and cooking rather than uh, medicine and nutrition, uh, for example. And I'll do my best to answer those questions uh, based upon my experience and my perspectives on, uh, on food and cooking. Uh, as we get started, I'd like to mention just a couple of items. Uh, you know, we uh, have the ability to take your questions. And on your screen in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a dialog box that says add question here. If you can go ahead and type in your question or your comment, uh, those will make their way to me. And they will then appear on the right hand side of your screen where you see several questions already populated. And uh, the second uh, item I'd like to mention is uh, as you take a look at that list of questions on the right-hand side of your screen, in the upper right-hand corner of each of those questions, you'll see a heart-shaped icon. And if it's a question that you would like me to answer sooner than later, you can click on that icon and it'll push that question up uh, toward the top of the list. Uh, but fear not, I will address all of the questions that come in. Uh, so whether it's sooner or later, I'll get to it. Um, and, you know, on that note, uh, you know, I'd like to, to the, to the best of our online ability here, facilitate a, a discussion of sorts. And, uh, you know, to that end, it really does require your participation. And so I encourage you to uh, post any questions and comments that you might have. Okay. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh very nice questions here uh, that I look forward to answering. Okay, so the first one uh, from Karen is uh, actually two questions. Uh, how do I estimate how many vegetables uh, are needed when a recipe calls for cups of that vegetable? Uh, for instance, one cup leaks. How many leaks? Uh, and then part two, uh, how do I chop an onion without crying? I uh, love the FOK course and all the instructors' feedback. Uh, well, thank you very much, Karen. It, uh, it, it certainly makes me happy to know that you're having a good time uh, in your course with the experience and also uh, are feeling good about the, the Ruby experience as well in terms of the feedback from our chef instructors here on our, uh, our, our small team, but uh, a team that... Uh, it's made up of individuals with a, a variety of rich experiences around uh, so many aspects of food. And so we're very happy to uh, help you along. Um, so part one, uh, you know, regarding recipes that uh, call for a, a cup of cut up leeks, for example, it could be onions or carrots or mushrooms or anything else that uh, come in these uh, natural sizes, uh, that is to say, irregular sizes, small, large, mature, young, uh, fat and squatty and thin and tall. Uh, and it's all that natural variation that really makes it very difficult, if, uh, if not impossible, um, for me to tell you with any accuracy how many uh, leaks will equal one cup. And some of that will also depend upon the size of your cuts. Right, uh, the smaller you cut an item, the more of that item will fit into that cup, and it'll be you know much more densely packed. And uh, so uh, there's the the natural variation as well as our own variation in the kitchen. So uh, the answer to part one is it really will depend upon your experience, and uh, you know as you 
process more leaks in this case, uh, in the case of your question, uh, you'll come to know uh, based upon the size of the cut and the size of the leak, just how much of that will fill up one cup, okay? And uh, so take notes along the way. I think that's, uh, I, I always suggest taking notes in the kitchen. I take notes myself uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis, uh, almost weekly, it seems like I'm jotting something down uh, so that I can refer to it later on as I continue to test a recipe or dabble in that area of cooking. And so I encourage all of my students to take notes as well. Okay. Uh, number two, uh, how do I chop an onion without crying? I don't know. Um, I've played around with things uh, over the years, and there are many ideas out there from uh, putting the onion in the freezer for 20 or 30 minutes uh, so that it doesn't uh, off gas quite as, quite as much when you slice into it, uh, to some of the goofiness that I've uh, done in front of my culinary students, uh, such as wrapping my head in plastic wrap and poking a hole in my mouth to, for breathing, which was actually effective, um, but it, uh, it, it frightens some people and uh, gets sweaty after a while. So I don't recommend it. Um, bottom line is I don't have a, a, a clean answer uh, that works for everybody all the time, okay? I appreciate your questions, a couple of challenging questions. Um, but uh, give, you know, give it a try and see what might work for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one from Grant. Uh, hi there, Eric. Uh, if there was one tip, trick, or piece of advice that you know now that you wish you knew when you started your culinary learning, what would it be? Uh, gosh, Grant, do I get just one? Uh, this is a, an awesome question and uh, a pretty big question as well. Let me... Uh, let me start it on this. Uh, you know, what comes to mind uh, for me, uh, you know, in terms of one thing that I know now, uh, that is that, you know, with experience, with the accumulation of knowledge and skill uh, has come greater confidence, right? That makes sense. And uh, what has come for me with greater confidence is uh, more calmness in the kitchen or generally around food prep and, and cooking. And so I you know, would like to share that with all of you. Uh, try to keep calm in the kitchen. Uh, find your, your place of calmness and enjoy the process, um, always falling back on the knowledge and the skills that you are continually developing you know, with every moment that you spend in the kitchen. And uh, you know, certainly early on, uh, you know, in my professional career, uh, I was uh, very concerned uh, about everything going right. And part of that is just my, my base personality where I uh, focus on the details. And I indeed, you know, want things to, uh, to come out the best that they can. And therefore, I, I plan and uh, write things down and draw diagrams and take notes and uh, do everything I can to try to ensure success. Um, but, uh, you know, things still come up, you know, challenges, uh, unexpected things around quality of produce, quantity of produce, the change in the number of your diners, uh, either up or down, uh, can shift your mise en place needs uh, for a given dinner event, for example. And, uh, you know, in all those times, uh, getting worried and getting anxious really isn't helpful. Uh, what is helpful is to keep, uh, keep calm, keep a clear head, and know that you're going to come up with a solution that's going to be the best solution possible for that uh, scenario. And everyone is going to be happy with uh, their experience in the dining room as well. And, you know, for me, some of the things along the way that have, uh, you know, informed my, uh, my, my foundation of experience include, um, you know, uh, experiences such as, you know, working in really large hotel kitchens. Uh, that was early on in my career. It makes life pretty easy when you've got a lot of space to stretch out in and you have lots of um, uh, help around you to wash things for you, to bring clean pans to you at uh, 
um, you know, at, at, the, at the, the, the moment you request them and uh, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's the easy life. Um, I've also uh, prepped uh, vintner dinners or winemaker dinners here in Oregon uh, in settings where all I had was uh, two saw horses and a four by eight piece of plywood, a long extension cord, uh, a KitchenAid mixer, and a food processor, along with my chef's knife. And you know, with uh, you know those three tools, uh, two or three of us have done the mise en place for. Uh, 40 or 50 guests, you know, each paying, uh, you know, 60 or $65 a head. And, uh, you know, the results have been just wonderful meals, uh, you know, great entertainment uh, for the for the diners, uh, but all done really outside on a crush pad at a winery on a piece of plywood. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that sort of a setting tells me that I really don't need all the fancy gadgets and all the extra help and the, the, the huge hotel kitchen to be successful. I've also uh, done food prep and service in uh, a food cart, uh, which is very limiting in its size. I've also done uh, uh, a meal prep for uh, you know, relatively, uh, I'll say, you know, fancy sort of meal prep uh, in kitchens that um, uh, you know, were only a step and a half in each direction, so uh, re re rather small in area. But uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it all comes down to your planning, uh, you know, the logistics that are involved in any meal prep, along with the skill and the know-how that you have. Now, of course, there are going to be limitations uh, based upon a setting. So, you know, it's nice to know uh, what you're getting into ahead of time by taking a look at the facilities uh, and then uh, planning your menu uh, accordingly. So you might need to simplify things uh, in one direction or, or another uh, to make it happen based upon limited refrigeration space uh, or the limited prep space. Uh, you know, those are a couple of examples that are uh, very commonly at the top of my head uh, when I look at, at preparing meals. Um, so, uh, you know, again, Grant, a great question. Uh, I think if we had a chance to sit down over a cup of tea, we could have a, a really nice conversation around this. Um, but uh, the, I think the quick thing that comes to mind again in summary is uh, to build up that base of experience based upon your knowledge and skill set and to be calm and all will go just as well as it possibly can. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up uh, from Natasha. Uh, hi, Chef. Thanks in advance for doing this. Uh, you are very welcome, Natasha. I'm glad you're here today. Uh, how can I preserve or use avocado if I have a lot? And let's say I freeze it. Uh, in what dishes uh, can I then use it? Okay, so avocados, uh, one of my favorite foods. Um, also an interestingly controversial food when it comes to uh, the, the economics and, and uh, the culture of the, the producing region. Uh, but that's, that's uh, another story. But uh, in terms of having lots of avocados, so I've been in this position and, um, uh, you know, you ask about freezing. So for sure, yes, you can freeze uh, avocados. What I recommend is that you uh, go ahead and remove the, the skin and the pit and then uh, freeze them. So one way you can do that is uh, if you want to maintain the whole form, uh, then go ahead and scoop that out of the... Uh, the skin, uh, remove the pit, and then place them on a sheet pan. Uh, I, I like to use a silk pad or, or a similar silicone baking sheet uh, as an underliner uh, because it, they don't stick then. And then pop that into the freezer for a little while until they firm up or, or freeze all the way through. And then I'll put those into a Ziploc bag uh, or some sort of a container for longer term storage in the freezer. Another way to handle avocados that are ripe uh, is, to, uh, is to dice them or to even to puree them uh, and then store them in a similar manner, uh, you know, in a Ziploc bag or in uh, similar units uh, uh, that are convenient to your food prep schedule. 
So you might store them in one cup or two cup containers, for example, so that uh, you can just pull one of those out when you need to prepare something. Okay, that makes the storage and the handling pretty easy. Um, you know, I like to uh, allow them to thaw, you know, whether it's uh, through the day uh, or even overnight. Uh, you know, do be aware that, uh, you know, avocados, are, uh, as you know, as we are, I think, aware, uh, they're very susceptible to oxidation and the browning, right, the, uh, uh, the discoloring. So you're going to get some browning uh, as well. But uh, then we want to think about how we're going to use those. And that's going to be that next part of your question. Uh, you know, I like to think about uh, using them in a puree form. So a, uh, a, uh, a guacamole, for example, comes to mind. Um, and, and, you know, there's gonna, there will be some surface uh, browning. But once you get that all mixed in, you're typically going to have that nice green color that comes through. So in terms of a, a dip, you know, something like a guacamole is going to be quite fine. Another way to use that is as an ingredient uh, in something else. So avocado is going to provide a lot of fat and also moisture. And so think about how you can utilize those basic components uh, in something else, such as uh, a, a quick bread, uh, even a, a yeast risen bread, could be pancakes, um, and, uh, uh, you know, something like that, where you can use a, a puree of avocado, uh, you know, in that uh, recipe. Uh, cookies uh, are not another nice way uh, to utilize avocado. Um, but give it a try, and then you'll start to, to make connections and find new ways uh, within your context of cooking where you can best use uh, that beautiful fruit, right, the avocado. Thank you. All right, next question. So hello, Chef Eric. Thank you for teaching me how to combine and create in the kitchen. Thank you, Barbara. I'm so happy that uh, you're finding uh, a good time uh, and a beneficial time here with us at Ruby. And on to your question here, would you please suggest a substitute for tahini? Weirdly, I'm allergic to sesame seeds. Uh, yes, every once in a while. Uh, I do meet a student uh, that is allergic to sesame seeds. And so uh, your question uh, comes up every once in a while. Uh, when we, generally speaking, when we consider a substitution for a given ingredient, we want to pause and think about the function of that ingredient in the given preparation. Now, generally speaking, uh, tahini provides fat. It also is a, a, a source of um, uh, texture in terms of viscosity uh, in a sauce, for example, uh, and certainly gonna add other, other elements in terms of nutrition, whether it's protein or something else, um, but also the flavor, right? We have this uh, deep nutty flavor that comes along with uh, the tahini. And so, you know, think about what other ingredient or sometimes more than one ingredient will provide primarily the fat and then also may come close uh, in replicating the flavor uh, that's provided by the tahini. And so, you know, really the easiest starting point is going to be any other seed or nut puree, right, or seed or nut butter that uh, is okay for you, uh, that doesn't cause any challenges in terms of, uh, you know, your body reaction. OK, um, if we want to move outside of the context of seeds and nuts, um, it can become a little bit more challenging. But uh, what comes to mind for me very often uh, is uh, in terms of the viscosity and some of that smoothness that we, we get from tahini is going to be a bean puree. It could be tofu or it could be some of the cooked bean of your choice. However, note that. Uh, you know, beans typically aren't high in fat. In fact, uh, they have astringency that comes along with them, which is uh, almost the opposite of fat in terms of the mouthfeel. So uh, you can bring in a bean puree to provide some of that body or viscosity, but then we might introduce a fat to that uh, to bring in some of the fatty quality of the tahini. Okay, so in this way, uh, we can certainly focus on tahini, but also other ingredients uh, that you want to replace. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, next question, uh, also from Natasha. If I want to start a cake or dessert business, uh, number one, is there a formula uh, how, on how to calculate your price for a particular dessert? And number two, how do you know how much a recipe will yield so you have no waste? Or is there a formula for that as well? Aha, okay, so uh, great question. These are a, a couple of uh, very basic and super important questions when it comes to food uh, preparation and planning uh, for a business, okay, whether it's uh, something informal that you might be doing out of your home kitchen or whether it's uh, a, a formal small business that you intend to develop. Uh, so to begin with, at the top of the list of questions on the right-hand side of your page, um, Patrick, our producer, has uh, listed uh, a link to one of our archive live events, and this is called Business Basics. And so I do suggest that you take a look at that, and that'll uh, it's about an hour long, and it covers uh, really some of this the, the basic things to be thinking about. Now, fundamental to your first question, uh, Natasha, is uh, the idea of food costing, right, or calculating the cost of each ingredient that goes into the dessert or the cake or anything else that you're going to be producing. And then part two will be to calculate the selling price, right? Or the menu price for that item, okay? And so the, uh, the live event, uh, archive live event, uh, will talk you through some of that process. But, uh, you know, I will say very basically that uh, it can be a tedious process, but it is one that is absolutely important uh, to successfully operating a business uh, around food. We, we must know the cost of goods, or as we say in, in this industry, food cost for each ingredient that goes into every preparation uh, on our menu. Okay. Now, in terms of the selling price, um, the way to determine that uh, is going to be in relation to the going uh, market uh, rate. Uh, so in other words, you want to take a look at your competition, whether it's grocery stores or other small scale catering companies and see what quality of goods they're selling and what their prices are. And then you can figure out where your product lies within that spectrum. Okay. And uh, you can then uh, also think about who your audience is and also what your food cost is on that product. So you definitely need to make a profit, right? So uh, you also want to figure out what your labor cost is and what your overhead expenses are, okay? So let me take a, a quick moment here and say that your, your three fundamental areas of expenses that must be addressed, calculated, and covered will be your food cost, your labor cost, and your overhead expenses. Overhead is going to be uh, electricity and rent and, and these other um, costs that uh, are part and parcel of doing business. Uh, labor expense is going to be your time as well as any hired labor uh, that go into uh, making the business happen. So think about what you're worth on an hourly basis, okay, whether it's minimum wage or something more than that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you want to think about a selling price that will cover all of that, plus a small margin of profit. And, you know, how much that is will uh, really be based upon uh, what you want to get out of the business. So, um, you know, generally speaking, in the, in the food service business, in the industry, uh, at least in the United States, uh, profit margins are pretty tight and uh, in, the, in the mid to low single digits, okay? Uh, but, you know, there's certainly some room to maneuver in there based upon your particular scenario. And uh, I'm happy to uh, further this conversation based upon your particular details uh, if you'd like to have that conversation, in which case you can reach out to me at support at ruby.com, okay? Um, and then part two of your question uh, is about the yield on a recipe. So, um, 
you know, on one hand, if we're starting out with uh, a common, say, nine inch diameter cake uh, that will often serve 12, we might decide to uh, adjust our portion sizes uh, so that it, it might feed fewer than that. Uh, so we have some idea of what the yield uh, is or is intended to be on certain recipes or formulas. Uh, now, otherwise, if uh, you know when we're preparing something, say in a uh, in a square or rectangular format, I'm talking about a dessert right now. Uh, it'll depend upon the portion size. Are we going to cut out uh, two inch by two inch pieces or? three inch by three inch pieces or some other size, okay? Uh, you know, in which case the yield can vary quite a bit. So in those cases, it will require you to do some testing of that, of that formula, of that particular yield, um, or, or I should say the, the batch quantity, and then you figure out what the yield is based upon the portion size, okay? And, uh, you know, if you're cutting out round, pieces, then you're going to have waste at the edges. Now, all of that waste, uh, the, the cost of that product needs to be passed on to the consumer. And so that's part of the recipe costing or the ingredient costing process. Okay. Uh, but there definitely will need to be some recipe testing uh, that you will need to do in order to determine uh, what the yield will be. Okay. Thank you. All right, and next up from Valerie, uh, what cookbooks, authors, chefs uh, do you recommend uh, to further my learning? Uh, wow, so this is a, a wide open question here, and there are probably a million books out there really on food of different uh, different sorts, and um, so you're asking me to narrow this down to cookbooks and, and chefs. Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm buying some time here to think through this as I'm, I'm talking here. But, you know, one thing that I would suggest that you do really is to think about the genre of cooking that you're interested in. OK, whether it's on the cuisine side or the baking and pastry side of the of the, of the world of food. Uh, if it's a regional cuisine uh, from North America, um, and that's, that's even that's a broad statement, right? We can look at uh, Mexican cuisine. Uh, we can look at um, uh, U.S. regional cuisine, and, or you know any other country and region around the world, and uh, do some digging and uh, find out you know who the authors are uh, in those particular uh, areas of, of your interest. Okay. Uh, in Mexican regional cuisine, it could be uh, Diana Kennedy or Rick Bayless or Marge Poor. Uh, these are uh, just examples of authors that come to mind uh, that have done uh, significant writing uh, in uh, the area of Mexican regional cuisine. Um, but uh, that's going to hold true for you know any uh, part of the world. So just uh, just you know do an internet search. Uh, reach out to your local library and if you have access now. I, I, would, I like to start there so I'm not uh, spending a lot of money on uh, new books uh, until I know that I want to have that in my library. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think that you'll find just a huge world of possibility out there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sarah says, love my FOK course. Uh, gosh, I want to, you know, thank you uh, uh, for, for giving us that feedback and thank you for being here today. And I'm, I'm uh, really pleased that you're enjoying your experience and uh, finding benefit uh, in the Ruby experience uh, and, and that it's enhancing your, your skill development, your knowledge development in the kitchen. Uh, so again, thank you, Sarah. Uh, number one, uh, I freeze trimmings and chicken bones to make stock. How can I intensify the flavor? And number two, uh, how do I revive the texture of frozen vegetables or are they best for curries and stews? Aha. So uh, part one, uh, making stock and intensifying flavor. Okay, so there's, uh, um, there's, let's say, three or so basic parts to this. So number one is to get the ingredients that you want into the pot. And so we'll start out with the, the trimmings from the freezer, 
right? Any vegetables, any uh, uh, chicken bones, for example. And it could well be any other bones, right? There's uh, uh, nothing wrong with mixing and matching, um, you know, as you make a, a rich stock. So uh, chicken bones plus pork bones make a really nice stock, for example. It could be leftover turkey bones after Thanksgiving or uh, really anything else um, uh, that you might find coming through your kitchen. Uh, you know, consider including uh, spices, right? If you want to kind of pull the flavor profile into a, the direction of a certain regional cuisine, um, and uh, you can really tailor the flavor and the complexity of the flavor, the richness of the flavor through adding spices, all right? Now, uh, so that's one way uh, to, to intensify flavor. Um, you know, another way to do that is to uh, increase the simmering time. All right, so in our chicken stock uh, uh, recipe that we feature in the in the pro cook course, for example, you know we recommend you know, two or three or four hours of, of simmering, and you know very often uh, that's adequate to produce a, a nice um, a gelatin rich uh, chicken stock. Uh, but I will also mention that it's uh, not uncommon uh, to simmer. Uh, a pot of stock for much longer than that. And, uh, you know, routinely uh, in my professional career, I was simmering uh, bones overnight. So they'd be going for uh, in the neighborhood of 12 hours. And, you know, I would you know, maybe uh, put the pot on at the uh, end of the uh, shift when I was going home at night, and then the morning person would take it off, or it could be the opposite. Uh, or maybe it was me coming in the following morning again uh, to take care of the stock. And you got to be very careful uh, so that you don't over reduce the stock, uh, which, uh, you know, I'm speaking from experience here. Uh, that's no fun uh, at all. Um, but the result is that you're pulling out just the, the, as much flavor and as much gelatin as you possibly can from all the bones and, and from the mirepoix. And the result is uh, just a beautiful uh, a finished uh, stock. Now, the other uh, part three to this question, uh, the answer to your question is, uh, you know, if you find that you want to further intensify the flavor of your finished stock, then continue to reduce it after it's been strained. And you're going to concentrate flavors, aromas, gelatin, uh, colors, um, and you're going to come up with uh, just a, a really nice product. Now, at that point, uh, depending on what you're making, right, you might choose to use the stock as is. Sometimes the, the, the gelatin or the flavor might be too strongly uh, concentrated, in which case you can use that as a base, uh, and then you'll uh, end up thinning it down a little bit uh, you know, by adding some water. Uh, in your soup or in your stew or to build up that, um, that braising liquid uh, to finish off the dish uh, that's in question, okay? Uh, but those are the ways that uh, I suggest uh, you intensify the flavor of your stock. All right, thank you. And let's see, next question from Tracy and Adrian. Welcome. Uh, how can I make vegan cream of mushroom taste like actual cream of mushroom? I've tried and it never turns out good. Same question for ranch dressing and Alfredo sauce. These three things are keeping me from going totally vegan or plant-based. Aha, great question. I thank you so much for asking this. Um, here goes. Uh, so, you know, when we look at certain ingredients or certain uh, groupings of ingredients, uh, there are, uh, you know, particular characteristics that contribute to the flavor that we um, become used to. And you know, when we look at uh, uh, certain ingredients that come from animals, okay, like uh, milk and butter and eggs, um, the, the flavor characteristics, uh, you know, is, as well as the, the mouth feel and even the, the function in cooking uh, is really Fantastic. I mean, they are uh, really just, you know, uh, wonderful ingredients uh, uh, in those ways that contribute to the end dish uh, in uh, really uh, memorable, hard to replicate sort of ways. And so when we move to a plant-based uh, diet, plant-based cooking, 
uh, it can be really challenging to replicate uh, or you know duplicate. Maybe I should say duplicate uh, the flavors and textures that come from these uh, base animal ingredients. And you know, we're here. We're talking about um, cream, right, or half and half, uh, maybe even whole milk. Uh, and it's that it's, it's just all the combination of the fats and proteins and carbohydrates that come together in that unique way um, that provide those food memories in the Alfredo sauce, for example, the, uh, the cream of mushroom soup. OK, so, uh, you know, when we move to a different set of ingredients, the, the plant based ingredients, um, we're, we're making substitutions. OK, and substitutions are. Uh, at least in my experience, they're 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 rarely 100% the same. There's always some difference, and in some cases, the differences are quite large. Uh, so, in number one, I would say that we should expect a difference in the end product. Okay. Now, uh, uh, you know the the thing that comes to mind in this in this uh, discussion is that with some substitutions that we make we're quite satisfied with those differences, right? On, a, on an aesthetic level, we find these new foods to be very satisfying and we're okay with that substitution. But there are some other uh, areas of cooking, some ingredients or some families of, of ingredients um, that uh, you know, we drive a, a different sort of satisfaction from. And, um, uh, it's just more difficult to to uh, to find substitutions uh, for those ingredients, and and this is a great example again, uh, cream and half and half, uh, whole milk, and so yeah, I think we we need to first of all expect that it's reasonable, right, that there's going to be a difference uh, based upon substitution, and uh, you know the 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 next part of this is to let ourselves be satisfied with that new product. If, if we really want to make the change, if, if, the, if our goal is to make the change to an all plant-based diet, then we need to at some point allow ourselves really mentally, that's where 90% of the game is, mentally to make that change uh, and accept these new flavors and textures. Um, they are, in, 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 when I think about substitutions, I look at them as being different from the original rather than telling myself it's inferior to the original. If I think about the, the new product as being inferior, right, to the original, then I'm never going to be satisfied. But if I can tell myself that it's different from the original, then it opens up that, that uh, space in my own mind uh, to become satisfied with this new item. And so that's the challenge here. Um, I don't have an answer for you in terms of how to recreate uh, that, all that texture and flavor and all that beauty uh, that comes through heavy cream and half and half, for example. I don't really think it's, it's possible. Um, but there certainly is a, a way to be, I think, satisfied uh, if we make that mental shift to allow ourselves to be satisfied with the new item. Okay, so it's not easy. Um, but give it a try. All right, thank you. All right, next up, uh, can you recommend a basic uh, book about fermenting vegetables? Uh, this will be a new adventure for me, and I am a bit intimidated by the process. However, I hear it's pretty simple. Uh, please share any tips that would help. This is from Carol. Welcome, Carol. Um, there are, I think, literally a ton of books out there on fermenting. There's just so many titles uh, over the years, over the decades. And, um, uh, you know, you know, you, you can, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago regarding books, you can take a look at that, uh, at your uh, some samples online, as well as at your local bookstore uh, or library. Uh, you know, one that I have looked at uh, off and on over the years uh, is called um, Preserving the Japanese Way. And the author is uh, Nancy Singleton Hachisu. And it's a, a particular focus on the Japanese way of preserving um, that appeals to, to me and the way we eat at home. Um, check it out if that appeals to you. 
Uh, if not, there are many, many other books out there, um, starting from uh, you know introductory uh, fermentation uh, to more advanced um, you know science talk uh, around the process of fermentation. So just depending on how deeply you want to dive into the topic, um, but you're right. Uh, you know fundamentally, uh, it is uh, easy. Uh, it is, after all, a natural process that uh, can occur even without your presence. And um, uh, I think the biggest uh, tip, most important tip, is to keep things clean. Uh, you know, avoid the introduction of competing microorganisms. Uh, what you want to do is uh, nurture and culture, you know, a particular strain of microorganisms to get a certain result. And uh, so you want to keep things clean, utensils and storage containers, and avoid the introduction um, of, of outside, um, you know, competition uh, while your product is sitting and doing its fermentation. Okay, enjoy. Thank you. All right. Uh, oh, yes, Sarah, uh, thanks for the reminder. Uh, your part two of the question here in terms of how to revive uh, frozen vegetables, uh, there really isn't a way to revive them. And I'll quickly explain that, um, you know, when we're talking about produce items, vegetables and fruits, right, which are mostly water, uh, as we freeze that item, water expands and it ruptures the cell walls such that when we thaw that product, it loses that firmness that it had before freezing. So we can never go back uh, to that firmness uh, that we enjoyed with the fresh product. So, uh, yeah, uh, and that's going to be true of uh, uh, most items. I think there might be, you know, some things that um, uh, have less of that effect, such as green peas or maybe corn kernels. But so many other things that are going to have a soft texture to them. So uh, for me, they then go into soups and stews and other simmered uh, preparations. Or maybe I'm using them uh, in a puree to make a, a, a sauce. Um, but with some things like, again, green peas or uh, corn kernels, those stay pretty firm. And uh, they can be used in stir fries uh, and other more dry preparations. And so, you know, give it a try and figure out, uh, you know, what you prefer in terms of your palate aesthetic and where you might um, figure out how to best utilize uh, some of those items, uh, knowing that we can never go back to the fresh state. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up. Uh, let's see. First of all, I want to thank you and your staff for all the wonderful guidance. Excellent, Jennifer. I, uh, again, I want to thank you and I want to thank all of you uh, that are here uh, today and, uh, you know, asking questions and, and actively listening and uh, taking uh, some of this information back to your kitchens to better your cooking experience. And, uh, you know, we're here for you. And if you have any questions beyond this live event, beyond my office hours, feel free to write uh, to support at ruby.com and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, sometimes we get back to you right away within a few minutes and sometimes it takes a couple of days, uh, but we'll answer your questions, okay? And uh, to drill down here, um, I've learned uh, so much uh, in the last few months and feel more comfortable in the kitchen. And my question is, uh, what kitchen tools would you say are absolutely essential? Uh -huh. So um, I think if there is truly an essential, um, you know, a, I'll say tool or equipment, it really is a chef's knife uh, in some fashion. What design it is, is up to you and your preference and your comfort and your budget. Um, but the knife is going to be the, the basis of all cooking. Now, beyond that, uh, what sort of uh, doodads we have in the kitchen will really depend upon the style of cooking that you do, uh, the amount of storage space that you have, and really your interest in um, collecting tools and equipment and using them and cleaning them as well. Um, but, um, you know, very basically, uh, you know, in, in many uh, kitchens, home kitchens these days, you know, we'll have a blender, we might have a food processor. I think those are at least uh, to our 
broad repertoire of cooking here at home are very important. They are very practical tools or equipment for us. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, I think about uh, you know something like these uh, graters. Uh, this is a uh, well, the, the, there are different. Oh, I see. This is a, a microplane uh, a brand. Uh, greater. They come in different uh, fineness or coarse, coarseness, and depending on the job at hand, I find these to be really practical. And you know, we uh, will use these on a, a frequent basis uh, in a given week. And then also, uh, you know, as I have gone through my my cooking career, you know, I find that straining devices are very important. And they range from you know large colanders um, to maybe smaller size strainers and colanders uh, to you know handheld sort of uh, flat strainers like this um, you know to strainers that have handles that stick up like this uh, to you know much much smaller size strainers uh, to make chai and so straining devices I find to be important. You know, also when it comes to uh, food uh, and ingredient uh, processing, you know, I find uh, a mortar and pestle uh, to be very important in our kitchen. And this is used daily. Uh, we actually have uh, several of these in different sizes and different, different materials. And I think that the flavors are truer. Uh, mechanical cutting uh, uh, devices with a motor attached to them, like a... Uh, a coffee grinder or a food processor will shift the flavor uh, a little bit. It depends on the ingredient or the food you're mixing. Uh, sometimes it can bring out bitterness or, or other uh, harsh aspects of flavor, but you don't get that when you're processing food by hand. And uh, so uh, that's important for me. And uh, those are the, th the things that I will very quickly mention as being um, important, not necessarily essential as in common to uh, every kitchen, uh, but important for us and the way that we cook. So think about the style of cooking, uh, again, the, the, the breadth of cooking that you do, the types of regional cuisines perhaps, uh, whether it's baking, pastry, right, or something else, and then you can um, decide what's going to be most effective, uh, you know, in your toolkit. All right, thank you. And uh, Peggy asks, is there a way to identify a bitter cucumber? Unfortunately, they can spoil a salad, but if you have, uh, if you have one, can you recommend an accompanying ingredient to counteract the bitterness, say in the dressing or another salad ingredient? Okay, um, no, uh, I don't know how to identify a, a bitter uh, cucumber. Um, you know, on this note, you know, I will say that um, I mean, you know, generally speaking, right, these natural food items uh, have a personality of their own. Uh, you might get, uh, you know, 19 out of 20 of them that are consistently sweet, but you'll get that 20th cucumber uh, that's bitter. And, you know, some of that has to do with um, just the natural variation in genes uh, that occurs from generation to generation. And sometimes it has to do with a place of origin. Um, and the way that it was uh, handled uh, between uh, the ground to your cutting board. Um, but I don't have a way, you know, without tasting it uh, to understand really how it's going to uh, uh, taste, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in the dish that I'm preparing. But, um, you know, keep in mind that when it comes to balancing a given taste like bitterness, that any other taste will um, add a competing balancing element on the palate. But in particular, sweetness will balance bitterness. So, uh, and to some extent, saltiness does too. So it kind of depends on what direction you want to go. And sometimes both of those can be introduced in a dressing, for example. So you might think about, uh, you know, uh, components in the dressing or other ingredients in that salad that have a sweet element to them. So it could be adding date puree to the dressing, or it could be adding strawberries to the salad uh, to introduce a sweet component that can compete with, right, or start to balance the bitterness of that cucumber. 
Now, that's not to say that you're not going to notice the bitterness, but it is to say that you will notice it less. OK, and, uh, you know, here, you know, I would say uh, also, uh, again, I'm just sharing my preference here. Um, but that is, uh, you know, try to uh, maintain uh, a little bit of each of these tastes so that we experience um, sweet and, and astringency and bitterness and saltiness and sourness and, and uh, pungency, uh, you know, all these different aspects of the foods. Um, and then coupled with the thousands of flavors that are out there. And much of flavor comes through the olfactory experience, right? The, the smell experience. So uh, uh, that will result in uh, really interesting and uh, you know, beautiful combinations that can satisfy uh, uh, you know, during the, the meal period. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next up, uh, do you have a foolproof method for cooking rice? Um, well, um, you know, the, we have a number of different rices, uh, here at home and the different, uh, uh, whole grain rices, brown and red and black. Uh, we have, um, uh, probably at least three different white rices as well. Um, basmati and, and Japanese style. And uh, I think we've got some, uh, polished sticky rice as well. And so all of these uh, require some different handling, right, in terms of the grain to water ratio. And the place that I start is to read the instructions on the package. Um, and then the second part is uh, to test it. Uh, because I've, uh, you know, the, the instructions on the package were written according to some test kitchen somewhere. And I don't know what kind of equipment they had or who was uh, controlling the process, but I'm going to do it my way. I've got my stovetop and my pot with its tight fitting lid or loose fitting lid. And, you know, maybe I'm making four cups instead of two. Um, I don't know what the intensity of the fire was that they were using, but I do it this way. And so I need to do a test batch. And uh, I will sometimes take notes. Uh, sometimes I just remember it. Um, but then I will fine tune that process to my particular way of, of making the rice and uh, figure out just how I want the end product to be in terms of the firmness or the wetness. And that will depend upon what I'm serving it with. It certainly depends on personal preference in, in a given context. And so those are the variables that uh, are at play when I'm making rice. And so those are things that I uh, would like you to think about as well. Um, but, uh, you know, other uh, things that I will do if I'm, if I'm making just a, uh, a, a pot of plain rice, um, I will soak the rice. And, you know, soaking time uh, can vary on certain uh, white rices to maybe 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Uh, and sometimes if it's brown rice, you know, I'll soak it for a, a day or two uh, and then I'll cook it. Sometimes uh, if it's cooked in a, uh, in a pressure cooker, then that soaking time is not going to be such a big deal. Uh, and that, that's a, a whole different story there. OK, in, in terms of the technology that you might use. Um, but soaking, I find uh, to be important. Now, at the end of the cooking process, I find that it's also desirable to keep the lid on the pot and let all that steam that's um, um, sort of floating around in the pan to reabsorb as the rice cools. OK. Uh, and, and so in other words, if you remove the lid from the pan and keep the lid off, you're going to lose a lot of moisture through the dissipation of the steam. And that's going to result in a firmer grain of rice. In other words, a less tender grain of rice. And uh, so I think it's important to, uh, you might fluff up the rice uh, shortly after it's cooked but then replace the lid and let that cool down and reabsorb that moisture for the most tender uh, grains of rice. Okay, so those are a couple of things to keep in mind. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, I was doing the steaming broccoli task. I know that for cooking time, it's easier if everything is at the same size, but then 
uh, I was left with a lot of broccoli of different size. So what do you do with leftover ingredients? Okay, so not just broccoli, but generally speaking. Okay, great, great question on uh, utilization and minimizing or eliminating food waste, uh, which is so uh, desirable and so important on a number of different fronts. Okay, but without getting into environmentalism and sustainability and uh, per personal ethics, let's talk about cooking here. So. Um, Things to do, uh, you know, I will uh, use those in a, in a stir fry um, where, you know, maybe uh, if I'm just, uh, you know, again, not cooking for guests where I want things to look maybe a little bit nicer, but just uh, generally cooking at home, um, you know, I'll, I might try to cut them, generally speaking, so that they're closer in size and use them in a stir fry or a saute. Um, I will add small little floret pieces to a uh, a soup. Um, you know, we happen to uh, have uh, soup for breakfast every morning. That's, uh, that's my thing. And so I use uh, leftover uh, vegetable pieces uh, to go in the soup. And this is a great way for, for, the, uh, for me to utilize small pieces of broccoli. Uh, you can also um, puree them and make them into a cream of broccoli soup. Um, so those are, you know, a few ideas. You can also uh, put them into uh, a quick bread, you know, uh, in the spirit of a zucchini bread, you can make a broccoli bread, um, or you can, you know, add it to banana bread. You can add it to a smoothie. Okay. And so these are some ways that I use leftover broccoli and other vegetables as well. All right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we've got an interesting question here from Carol. So what's the 605 referred to on uh, Patrick's title to the, uh, the live events? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so it looks like, okay, so Patrick is providing a, uh, a response to your question, Carol. I'll let you go ahead and read that. Uh, as I move on down to Maria's question. Uh, I'm learning about caramelization now. So however, caramelization in my reaction uh, is unhealthy. Uh, how do you reconcile plant-based no oil diet with creating tons of unhealthy advanced uh, glycation in products by browning foods? Maria, um, there are many, many things in the cooking process that um, arguably uh, are unhealthy uh, on a um, if we really want to drill down in these different areas and um, I don't worry about them. Uh, you know, the, um, these uh, uh, products, uh, they appear in, uh, I think in most cases, at least in my cooking, in relatively small doses. Um, I believe uh, that it's offset by the good nutrition uh, that I get from all the wonderful food that I eat. And um, uh, I think if, you know, if, if one is concerned, uh, particularly about caramelization and Maillard reaction uh, results, then uh, avoid those two techniques. Um, and that, uh, you know, will eliminate at least that, those areas of concern. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next up, I'm currently in the process of building the kitchen of my weekend house uh, from zero. Um, can you give me any advice on what uh, should I consider in an ideal kitchen and pantry? Um, you know, when it comes to general kitchen layout, and I'm, I'm no interior designer here, but just very basically in terms of kitchens that I have worked in, um, uh, you know, think about these uh, work zones. And, you know, once upon a time, uh, I think the idea of, 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 a, of a work triangle was talked about. Uh, you know, today uh, there's more discussion around work zones, and that's the way I think about it in terms of um, certainly access to food storage, um, convenient access to your refrigeration, your freezer, your, your pantry, or, or a dry storage, and then where you have your uh, water source, um, your sink, uh, your garbage can, uh, and then your cutting board. Okay. And, uh, you know, probably in most home kitchens, we're going to have, you know, one sink, maybe one refrigerator. Um, but when it comes to a, a trash receptacle and a cutting board, you know, we might be able to create multiple uh, zones or places 
for those things so that we essentially have a, uh, a self-contained prep area. And uh, then we can occasionally take those two or three steps to the sink uh, in one direction or two or three steps to uh, the food storage area uh, to get ingredients or to put away our mise en place. Um, and so, you know, I would generally uh, recommend that you think about those um, uh, work zones, work spaces, and then the travel line to the water and to the food storage place relative to uh, the congregation of other people, okay? And to try to, uh, uh, to, to avoid too much concentration of activities in a single corner of the kitchen, for example. Okay. And then that, uh, you know, alleviates um, uh, uh, bumping into people or waiting uh, to access, uh, you know, certain things. Okay. And that brings more efficiency and I think more joy uh, to the kitchen experience. Okay. I'll give those basics a thought. Thank you. All right, uh, next up, what's the difference between sauteing and stir frying? They both require high heat. So is it that stir frying requires a higher amount of heat and done strictly in a wok? Um, um, yeah, so you know, fundamentally they're the, they're the same, right? In, in, uh, very basically, right? In terms of uh, the approach to uh, a dry heat cooking method, uh, using uh, you know, usually a relatively small amount of oil, certainly compared to uh, any deeper frying. Um, and then, you know, relatively high heat and, and keeping things moving in the pan uh, are going to be common characteristics. But otherwise, um, you know, stir frying uh, generally has uh, um, a, a procedure that's followed uh, from uh, that, that tends to be more uh, tightly delineated than sauteing, at least in my experience. Uh, we tend to associate uh, stir frying with a wok as well. Again, just based upon uh, the part of the world where that uh, style of cooking has come from and the technology that's used in that part of the world. Okay, so yes, you are uh, right on uh, when you highlight those couple of items. Uh, but otherwise, uh, a lot of overlap uh, at a fundamental level uh, between those two cooking methods. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, can you more fully answer the question about what to use as substitutes for a cream in Alfredo sauce or cream of mushroom alternatives? Uh, you know, I think the uh, the quick go-to here would be some of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the common plant-based philosophy around uh, nut sauces and, and cashews. Uh, as, a, as a base ingredient is going to be fairly neutral in flavor, yet fairly fatty and giving a nice mouthfeel. Um, so, you know, that would be the place that I would start with when it comes to really any cream sauce. And then from there, you can kind of experiment, right? If, if you don't like cashews or can't eat them for some reason, then you might try some other seeds or nuts, uh, follow the, the similar procedure to make uh, a creamy uh, sauce. Uh, and I recommend a high-speed blender uh, to do this sort of work in, in order to get the, um, the smoothest consistency. Uh, which is part of that ex that Alfredo experience, right? Part of our satisfaction uh, around food is in the texture and the the mouth feel aesthetic. And so, if we can do our best to replicate all aspects uh, of that end product, we're going to get a little bit closer to um, satisfaction. And so, that would be the place that I would start uh, when it comes to cream of mushroom soup, uh, you know, sort of ingredient alternatives. Uh, and a white cream sauce like we might use in an Alfredo. Okay, thank you. Next up, uh, my question is, other than the obvious bruising, how can I pick out a veggie uh, that will cut well? Uh, I brought home tomatoes, which felt firm, uh, but when I started cutting, uh, they fell to mush. Other oh, tomatoes sliced beautifully. What am I doing wrong? Well, Angela, uh, I have a feeling you're not doing anything wrong. Um, you're, uh, you're doing everything right. It's just the variation in the produce. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables have their own personalities. And, it, you know, it also depends on how they've been handled. Uh, tomatoes uh, in particular are, um, I consider them a fragile fruit. And if they are held in storage that is too cool, for example, uh, the 
uh, textures can shift uh, in a way that we might not like, such as become mealy um, or grainy. So, uh, you know, we don't always know how produce has been handled before we receive it. And so there's a little bit of, um, I guess, risk, right, that we're taking when we buy something at the grocery store, for example. Uh, you know, again, not to mention just the, the natural variation that, that comes from generation to generation of, uh, of a given item. So if we're buying something even from the farmer at the market, uh, there could be uh, an exception or two within that batch of uh, you know, fruit or vegetables that we're looking at. So, um, you know, I don't, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, aside from, you know, as you say, looking for obvious bruising and, and pay, paying attention to the, the general firmness of any given item, uh, take a look at, at the visual texture as well. I, I don't have a, a specific answer for, for tomatoes. I mean, I have my way of um, choosing um, juicy oranges, for example, at the grocery store, where I look at uh, the, the skin texture. Kind of hard to explain. If you're next to me at the grocery store, I can give you some examples. Um, but start to look at the items as well very closely and, uh, and, and to get to know these different uh, characteristics and to see if a pattern emerges for you. Okay, thank you. Next up, uh, some of the recipes I've tried throughout this course uh, came out bland, even when following the recipes to the T. What can I do to improve the quality of flavor and have all my dishes taste savory, rich, and mouth melting? Aha. Uh -huh. So um, let me first say that um, we, uh, um, perhaps, uh, Patrick, can you repost uh, the link to the flavor development live event from the archives, please? And uh, we'll direct our... It's up. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll direct everyone uh, to consider looking at the live event on flavor development, uh, where I talk about just a number of techniques as well as ingredients uh, that kind of nudge your, your food prep in that direction. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I will say that recipes uh, are really provided as a framework. And um, most recipes, you know, so I'm, I'm not talking about baking and pastry, okay, where we can't really make adjustments once we start the process. But on the cuisine side of the kitchen, where we can add a little dash of oregano and, and a pinch of this and an extra carrot there uh, to make adjustments along the way, that's what we have to do. Uh, and so I uh, encourage all of you to uh, focus on your knowledge and skill development, okay, rather than the word of the recipe, because the word of the recipe is really just a suggestion, because as we've been talking about today, uh, the quality of the produce changes uh, from uh, you know, week to week throughout the growing season, from place to place throughout the world, uh, from variety to variety, depending on how it's been handled. And um, so we need to be able to react uh, to all that beautiful variation uh, that is part and parcel of cooking. Uh, so, uh, you know, we need to, uh, you know, learn to taste throughout the cooking process and to make adjustments uh, with seasoning and uh, the flavor development. Um, so as we learn these different techniques around caramelization uh, or the layering of different ingredients or the judicious use of salt, uh, we can create beautiful food, okay? Um, and then also keep in mind that, you know, as we uh, work through a recipe, um, our, our own physiology, right, is unique. Our own palate sensitivity uh, is unique. And so if um, uh, a recipe is published, uh, you know, in our Ruby collection, uh, you know, I can guarantee you uh, that if it's a Ruby recipe, that it's been produced multiple times and it's been tested in that way and it uh, came out tasting good before it was published uh, for all of you to see. But if you're coming up with blandness or bitterness or something else, um, it could possibly be due to the variation that I just talked about. So it'll be necessary for you to make some changes, again, based upon your knowledge and your skill around the food handling, okay? And of course, the refinement of those adjustments will come with experience, all right? So uh, don't give up and uh, stay uh, in the kitchen 
and keep on cooking. All right. Thank you. And next up, uh, do you have a formula for creating uh, uh, dressings, okay, um, or sauces based on the five basic tastes, uh, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami? Do the portions of each vary depending on the type of flavor profile or cuisine you're attempting? Oh, okay, so yeah, this is an interesting question. So let me start from the tail end and let me, let me work up here. Uh, certainly, you know, if you're um, looking at global cuisine, global flavors, regional, regional cuisines, then there are particular uh, tastes and flavors that characterize, right, that given uh, cuisine. And it'll be, you know, up to you to study uh, those aspects of the cuisine and to become acquainted with the ingredients themselves, as well as the handling techniques that can affect the flavor experience. Okay. Um, and you're going to notice that, you know, in, uh, in different cuisines that, uh, you know, these different base tastes that you're mentioning here, right? The sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Um, I also include in that list uh, pungent, uh, which is that hot uh, taste that we might get from peppercorns or ginger or chilies uh, as, as part of my six tastes. Um, and uh, then you can make adjustments from there, right? Uh, oftentimes we have the presence of all of these tastes or maybe most of them, maybe four or five of them, but in different proportions. Um, and uh, then, you know, that's really what um, uh, identifies the flavor profile of a given regional cuisine. Okay. And so, you know, is there a, 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 a quick formula? No, there's not. It's, it's really uh, taking a, a closer look at the regional cuisines and uh, playing really with some, start with some basic um, uh, recipes that will introduce you to some of the characteristic profiles. And then you can go from there and play with more subtle or nuanced combinations of those tastes and flavors. Okay. But it sounds like a great project and it's one that's going to take a while. Uh, it sounds like uh, you'll be eating some, some pretty fun food for, uh, for a while until, you know, you um, uh, are very satisfied, I think, with uh, developing the nuances of your skills. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up, uh, have you heard of seasoning non-stick fry pans? I just bought one that says to. I also found an article that says to season all nonstick pans and to never use spray oil in them. Uh, true? Um, Kathy, I don't know. Um, you know, I've, I've never heard of that. Um, so I just don't have anything to say. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to uh, maybe send me a link, I'd be very happy to read up on this. I'm very curious since it's something that I'm unfamiliar with. All right, thank you. All right, next up, uh, looks like amino, a uh, liquid amino uh, has as much sodium as low sodium soy sauce. Uh, which do you recommend for someone who is uh, conscious of keeping sodium intake low? Um, you know, I, when it comes to liquid aminos for me, uh, I recognize a flavor difference uh, compared to soy sauce. And my flavor preference is with soy sauce. And so that's what I reach for. And so I think uh, there's going to be that uh, aesthetic that's going to appeal to you one way or, uh, or the other, perhaps. Um, if it doesn't, then maybe it's just a matter of flipping a coin and um, making the decision. Perhaps it's going to be on, uh, on cost. Maybe one is cheaper than the other. Um, or maybe some other characteristic that is important to you. Now, another approach is to simply use less of it. Um, I think that's uh, uh, probably a, uh, a, a pretty sound approach to lower sodium cooking. Uh, just use a little bit less of it. Let your palate make the adjustment uh, to, to the, the, the dish, the finished dish, that's a little bit lower in salt. It's going to taste different. Um, but, you know, as we talked about earlier today, allow yourself time to, to, to make that shift and to uh, find the goodness in everything else that's still present uh, in that dish. Now, it might mean that you are starting to use more aromatic ingredients like fresh herbs and spices because um, the aroma 
makes up a large part of the flavor experience. And uh, so if we can bring in uh, some of these other um, flavor uh, facets, as well as other tastes um, through different techniques of flavor development, then you're going to find that you can do with less salt. Okay, so give that a try. Thank you. Uh, what's your favorite way to cook okra? What are some tips in preparing okra? Um, wow, you know, okra sauteed uh, and okra deep fried uh, tastes good. Um, you know, if you're sauteing, I think a, a hot pan uh, is helpful in drying up some of that uh, mucilaginous quality of, of okra so it doesn't get too snotty, too sticky, uh, which is a turn off for some people. And, uh, you know, otherwise, um, uh, you know, at, uh, at home here, it's often uh, cooked with uh, an Indian flavor profile. So there's some spices that go into it, some souring agent um, in terms of the taste uh, that we're building in the pan. Uh, but take a look at, um, you know, otherwise some uh, preparations, uh, some recipes around okra and, and find what might suit your palate and give that a try. All right. Okay, and let's see, for Natasha's question, it looks like Patrick has provided a response on how to access the links, so I'll move on to Sunny's question. Uh, hello, Sunny. Uh, with regard to making chicken stock either white or dark, how is the flavor or texture of the stock impacted if you choose to use bones from a roasted chicken, perhaps one you made the night before, versus using fresh uncooked bones? Um, how is flavor or texture okay impacted? So. Um, first of all, I'll say that if you have cooked uh, chicken or anything else via a dry heat method, so usually it's roasting, then you know by all means uh, use those bones to make stock because they have a lot of goodness still left in them that will be extracted through the moist heat cooking process of simmering. Okay, and you know when we cook an item uh, uh, via a dry heat method, uh, it kind of depends on what makes its way to the stock pot. Um, but sometimes we have these caramelized uh, edge pieces, uh, maybe uh, wing pieces, for example, from a chicken that are going to impart darker color uh, to the stock. And also, uh, you're going to get deeper flavor. Uh, from that as well, because uh, caramelization or browning uh, contributes to flavor development. And now in terms of texture, uh, we're talking about uh, primarily the, the gelatin extraction. So gelatin comes from collagen. Collagen is the connective tissue uh, that we're breaking down through the long-term simmering process of stock production. And, uh, you know, generally speaking, in my experience, I find um, probably a little difference um, uh, I'll just say no difference. Uh, I can't think of um, anything in particular to address. Uh, it's going to be a matter of simmering time and, uh, you know, liquid to solid ratio uh, in terms of concentration of flavor. Okay, but just give it time to simmer, uh, to break down collagen, which turns into gelatin, which gives you the texture of the mouthfeel in the finished product. Okay, but uh, yeah, I think utilizing bones that are left over from roasted anything uh, is a really smart way to produce stock the next day. All right, thank you. And next up, uh, number one, uh, this is from Paulina. Good day. Uh, what if I'm unable to find a specific ingredient or substitutes listed in the recipes? Um, so, you know, generally, substitutions are not listed in recipes. Um, there are exceptions, um, but uh, you know, usually the reason for the substitute can vary quite a bit, and the options for substitutions can be many. And um, so, um, I'll address this uh, from a couple of fronts here. Number one, when it comes to general sub, you know, generally substituting uh, an ingredient, think about the function of the original ingredient in that recipe, okay? And so was it uh, primarily for color? Was it primarily for flavor? And, and what is that flavor? Is it to 
to provide texture um, or uh, you know some sort of a, a, a some other aspect of mouthfeel, okay, like uh, fattiness or coarseness, um, you know, uh, fibrousness, stiffness, right? These different uh, aspects of texture, and then try to find something that will replicate as many of those characteristics as possible, okay? Uh, noting that it might be necessary to uh, bring in two or three or, or more ingredients to fulfill the functions and characteristics of that original ingredient, okay? So that's my general approach, okay, to making substitutions. Now, um, when it comes to assignments, uh, the image upload cooking assignments in our courses, um, generally speaking, take a similar approach to substitutions. However, please keep in mind that what you produce must be in, in alignment with the learning outcomes of that given assignment. Okay. So in other words, uh, your substitution should not change the outcome significantly such that it veers away from the learning outcome, in which case you'll be asked to redo that assignment, okay? Um, so if you have a question uh, about that, uh, then please send us a, a message, right, at support at ruby.com, uh, or you can post uh, your question to the, the Q&A function, which is on your task page, and we'll respond to that, okay? Be as specific as you can uh, in terms of the reason for the substitution and uh, the context, you know, otherwise of, the, of that substitution. And then, you know, we can provide uh, the best feedback for you. Okay, thank you. And let's see, next up, we have another question from Sunny. Uh, I tried the steamed eggs with soft polenta sausage and roasted red peppers. Uh, the water was between a simmer and a boil at all times with three ramekins in my basket. Okay, eggs and steaming. Uh, all eggs cooked at different times. Why? Too crowded? Too much filling in some versus others? Um, yeah, interesting question uh, indeed. So, um, you know, I uh, think, first of all, that there's going to be a temperature differential inside your steamer. Uh, in some fashion, right? That's going to be, I think, the the logical uh, hypothesis here. So the next part of the of my question is, why would that be so? Okay, um, you know, heat moves, right? There's convection inside of a container that uh, is producing heat uh, in this way when you're steaming, and so if uh, if there is for some reason uneven heat circulation, then you're going to get faster or slower cooking. Um, sometimes we have, uh, layers, uh, of, uh, you know, within, within our steaming container. So the, the lower most items closest to the heat source, i.e. the hot water get cooked faster. Uh, if they're just on the same plane, but in different positions, then something is affecting the airflow or the, the heat flow, uh, within that container. And, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily know what that is, but, uh, you know, being too crowded could be a factor that I would test for. Um, and certainly if there are different quantities uh, in each ramekin, right, the, the item with the least amount is going to heat up fastest and therefore cook fastest. Um, and so, you know, those are things that I would test for. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, give that a try and see if you might even that out. Okay, the, the cooking results. All right, thank you. All right, uh, next from Donna. Uh, should dried beans be stored in the juice they were boiled in or without the juice? Uh, you know, either way, um, if you keep it in that uh, cooking liquid, uh, you're going to maintain the moisture while it is uh, being stored, whether it's in the fridge or in the freezer. Okay, that's, it's not a big deal. Um, if you strain the beans, and hold them, then there's going to be an opportunity for them to slowly dehydrate. And uh, that's going to depend upon the storage conditions and how long they're being stored. Okay, so definitely store them with a lid on them 
and then do your best to use them sooner than later in order to have uh, the most uh, moist and tender beans. All right, thank you. All right, next up, I recently picked up a beautiful tagine. As I search plant-based Moroccan tagine cooking, I'm finding it seems to be a, a better tool for meat eaters. Grateful for your thoughts on this, Eric. Um, uh, you know, at, 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 at tagine, um, you know, on um, one hand is just a, just a container. I mean, it's just a cooking vessel, okay, that, uh, you know, once upon a time was a uh commonly used or a traditionally used vessel uh, in regions of uh, North Africa. And it, uh, you know, there's a tradition of meat cookery in that part of the world. Uh, so therefore, you know, many of the tagine recipes that we see today uh, have a meat component to them. But, uh, you know, you can, you know, just certainly venture out on your own and, uh, you know, dabble in the plant-based preparations with your tagine and uh, adjust cooking times based upon the, the density and the texture of that product. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, tagines in this uh, fashion, uh, when it comes to plant-based cooking, do really well with more dense products. So I think about... Um, uh, winter squash, maybe a, a Hubbard squash, or you know some sort of a dense pumpkin, uh, and uh, potato, you know, a waxy potato, for example, uh, or things that benefit from being cooked down during that process. It could be a tomato or an eggplant that um, could be very nice when it's very soft, uh, alongside a more firm uh, squash, uh, for example, and so you know, play with these combinations, take notes, see what textures suit your palate, um, and figure out what sort of flavors are also satisfying to you as well, okay? Um, but uh, the tagine as a, as a cooking vessel uh, otherwise can be quite uh, suitable for, uh, for plant-based cookery as well. All right, enjoy. And uh, next up, it looks like we've got uh, our last uh, set of questions here. Uh, I have several frozen containers of half and half. Uh, I thawed one con container or uh, one carton and found a separation of the fat from the liquid. How do I recombine the liquids and fats to get a smooth product? How do I use the thawed product success successfully in recipes? Aha. So, um, uh, you know, dairy products, when we get them from the grocery store, are homogenized, right? So the, the fat uh, is broken down into microscopic particles in suspension. And when we freeze these dairy products, uh, the freezing breaks um, this emulsification. And well, we experience separation uh, with fat and the water components. And uh, it is really difficult to, uh, it's, typically difficult to recombine those in a way that is exactly the same as it was before because the homogenization is done with specialized industrial equipment at the, at the processing factory. And we just don't have that technology in our home kitchen. Um, so the, you know, your best bet is to put it into a, a blender and the faster it's spinning, the, you know, the better. And then, uh, you know, use that as an ingredient, um, you know, in, uh, in, in baking, for example, right? It could be uh, any sort of a bread leavened or, uh, or not, you know, I should say yeast leavened. It could be um, chemically leavened, like a, like a quick bread, um, you know, or, uh, or even an unleavened flat bread, right? It could be a crepe uh, uh, or, or cookies. Uh, those are all going to be you know, easy ways to use that. Um, you know, you can also, um, if, if, if you can bring those components together reasonably well, you can use this in a, in a cream of soup preparation. And um, uh, another way to approach this is if, if, if they're not coming together, that uh, the fatty side and the, uh, the water side uh, of this broken emulsification, then you can introduce a thickening agent, um, whether it's a slurry, you know, even a roux, depending on what it is that you're making. And um, that thickening uh, agent and that process of introduction 
um, it will be a way to to bring that together, but you're going to have a um, a slightly thicker product in the end. Now you can adjust that thickness to some extent by the addition of water or a water-like uh, ingredient um, to thin it down. Okay, uh, but what you're doing is um, you're introducing a starch to uh, to bring stability. Uh, to these two uh, components, where previously the emulsification uh, uh, you know, via the homogenizing process was doing that job, okay? And so this is a, another way to do that with uh, a thickening agent, okay? So give that a try. See if you can find some uh, ways to enjoy uh, the half and half uh, in a sauce uh, or in a, in a baked product uh, or in a soup for example. Okay, thank you very much for asking that question. And that brings us to uh, the conclusion of my office hours today. I want to thank uh, each one of you uh, for joining in uh, today's program, whether you were here from the, the opening of the show uh, or whether you joined midstream. I hope you found some benefit in the discussion today. And once again, if you have follow-up questions or additional questions, uh, please send them our way uh, at support at ruby.com and we will be happy to respond to you. Okay. And until next time, uh, happy cooking. Thank you.